In North America, our insatiable appetite for natural resources has trampled the human rights of indigenous people for centuries. From the Arctic wilderness to the American prairies, people once forced from their land by ranchers and homesteaders are now facing off against energy corporations, oil companies, lumber companies, and nuclear power companies. Today, we look at several ongoing conflicts and ask, how long can we support this economy, where people and land are merely a standing reserve for our energy wants? Is profit the only sacred thing? I'm Stephanie Bernstein. And I'm Michael Jones. And this is Source Code. Today, we take you to Ontario to witness the struggles of the Grassy Narrows First Nation as they defend their land against timber baron Weyerhaeuser. We'll hear from Diné activists and musicians Blackfire, working for justice on the reservation, and meet Eloise Cobell, who's suing America for billions, that's right, billions of dollars of back rent due to Indians. But first, several Indian nations are embroiled in struggle over habitat, land, and economic security. Now they fear their very existence is in danger. In North America, our insatiable appetite for natural resources is trampling on the human rights of indigenous people. Native tribes, shoved around for centuries, now fear their existence is in danger. We are caribou people, so uh, we do caribou song, we do caribou dance, we do caribou stories. It's our clothing, it's our shelter, it's our food on the table, it's our tools. That's our way yeah. of life. respect that and we honor that. We honor the environment that we use uh, to survive for thousands of years and that's our way of life. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is the ancestral home of the Gwich'in people of Northeast Alaska. Oil and gas development in the refuge was narrowly defeated in 2005, but this year the federal budget factors in profits from oil and gas drilling leases in the refuge to pay for the Iraq war and hurricane devastation in the Gulf region. We call it uh, of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. That means sacred place where the life begin. The Gwich'in fear that the Bush administration's plan to drill where caribou migrate and calve will destroy their way of life. Who's going to benefit is a, 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 the same old oil company, the same old people. Once the lease is open, it's, it's going to go to highest better. It's going to put a precedent against other protected area like Yellowstone Park, Yosemite. They're going to get in there. They're going to get into your backyard. Global warming and our government's reckless disregard for the Kyoto Protocol is already hurting the Inuit people who live in the Canadian wilderness. So how would you respond if an international assessment that was prepared by over 300 scientists from 15 countries and that wove into it the indigenous knowledge throughout the entire process concluded that your way of life, that your age-old culture, culture and economy was doomed and that you might become just a footnote in the history of globalization. What would you do? The Inuit pleaded with audiences at the Montreal Climate Change Conference to pressure the United States government to wake up. What we want is the United States to stop violating our rights, the right to life and physical security, the right to personal property, the right to health, the right to practice our culture, the right to use land traditionally used and occupied, and the right to the means of subsistence. Margie in Bull Creek is standing her ground for what little remains of the Skull Valley Goshoot Reservation. I was five years old when we first moved here. There was five of us. And my, when we first got here, my, my father built a home. It was one room. Her tribe's land once spread east from Salt Lake City to Elko, Nevada. Now it's just two square miles, 
surrounded by hazardous areas like the Dugway Proving Grounds, the Deseret Chemical Depot, and an Air Force bombing range. Although we're surrounded by these um, areas, our reservation means a lot to us because it's our home and it's part of who we are as Native Americans and all the things that we believe in. It's our indigenous land and it's just something that can't be taken from us and that's what's happening. John Parkin of Private Fuel Storage has made a pact with the Goshutes to store 40,000 tons of nuclear fuel for 20 years on 840 acres of their land. Marjean and others in her small tribe are fighting the plan. She says the agreement was worked out with only three members of the tribal council, that details were kept secret, and her people are being endangered and exploited. We didn't have that, uh, that opportunity to be able to view whatever resolutions there are to 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 pass it was something that was brought out and put on the table and say sign it the terms of the contract uh, have not been kept secret from the goshu people as i've spoken at three of their general council meetings which are open to all members of the tribe this site's going to be like two miles down from where i'm sitting now and there's going to be an invisible wall there and and nobody on on in the village is going to know what's going on because we're not gonna be told if, if anything happens. Something very deadly happened on the Goshute Reservation in 1968. Nerve gas spilled by the Air Force killed 6,000 sheep. Her father's herd was destroyed. He didn't know what happened uh, when, he, when he looked and tended his sheep. The sheep were, were um, acting strangely. They were um, rolling around and, and um, Something was bothering them, something was making them, um, they were dying. Private fuel storage assures that nuclear waste will be stored safely, but experience has taught Marjean otherwise. She fears a nuclear spill will happen this time and is convinced that PFS won't be able to handle emergency response if things go wrong. And with Nevada's Yucca Mountain in limbo, she also worries that temporary storage could become permanent. Most of the tr tribes were wise enough to turn it down. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. But, but our council and our attorney um, back then wanted to bring money into the tribe and they thought this was, uh, will bring in a lot of money for us. There are few opportunities for the Goshut and others in this sparsely populated area of the state. Tribal leaders agreed to the plan to create jobs and economic growth for their people. They say Native American people are, you know, are the people of the land, but if you don't utilize the land, you don't take care of the land, then what's the land going to do for you? What are you going to do with a reservation that's contaminated? What are you going to do with a reservation when your people are dying, when your relatives, when your children, your grandchildren are, are sick with cancer? As a Native American, you know, we do live two lives, you know, we have to live our Native American life and we have to live the Anglo life. And uh, we, if we don't live with both of them, we're going to be lost. But Marjean says they could lose everything, that the price her people are paying is much too high. What I'm saying is environmental injustice. They have a large corporation coming down on a small, um, unique, traditional band of go shoots. And they're, and they're promising us money and, and what we have isn't worth all that money, especially if it leads to um, relocation and destruction and sickness. It's for the, our future children. It's for our future that there may be something there for them. learned in school how Europeans came to America and convinced Indians to give up claim to land in exchange for trinkets and beads. One woman is tired of being treated like an uneducated child and is bringing suit against the government of America for money owed Indians. A lot of money. KGNU news reporter Joe Edelstein talks with Blackfeet leader Eloise Cobell. Now you brought a suit 
and it's gone on for quite some time. Sketch the history of the case. The tribes and the individual Indians always knew there was something horribly wrong. And so we filed uh, the largest class action lawsuit against the United States government on June 10th of 1996. This case is for 500,000 individual Indians across the nation. It's um, all of the uh, Indian nations that were a result of the Allotment Act, where they came in, they took uh, the land that was already owned by the tribes and divided it up into parcels and redistributed it to individual Indians. And so there was many um, uh, Indian nations that were divided up as a result of the Allotment Act. And we all knew what was the undercurrent of this entire uh, Allotment Act. It was how do we get more land away from Indian people. That was the bottom line. Tell us about the Blackfeet and about other nations that are, that are involved in this case. Um, where I'm from, the Blackfeet Indian Nation, um, originally, the entire territory of the Blackfeet people was the entire state of Montana, part of Canada, into Wyoming. That was the Blackfeet Nation. And as time went on, each agreement and treaty, when they wanted more and more land, kept pushing and pushing us back and pushing us back. So now we're, we're a postage stamp size in the state of Montana. And uh, we have some very vast diversified resources. We have oil and gas, we have timber, we have agricultural lands, we have the beauty, we have the cultural lands and sacred sites that we all believe in that is, is part of us. The major focus of your life for years now has been a suit against the BIA. It's not only the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it's the Department of Interior, it's the Department of Treasury for mismanagement of money money that belongs to us, money that we own, money off of our resources on what's on top of the land, what's underneath the land. And this is money that was collected by the Department of Interior and um, was squandered away. We don't know what happened. And this suit is for accountability of that money to individual Indian people. How can they do this? How could they withhold billions of dollars that they got from the use of Native American owned land and not give it to the people who owned it? In this situation, the Treasury acts as the bank. And um, the Department of Interior was not giving them the information of who owned that money. And as a result, um, they said they didn't know what to do with it, so they used it for, to reduce the national debt. And uh, so in the meantime, you know, they could be utilizing or renting out land to oil companies or timber companies or whomever, uh, agricultural leases, and, um, and, and not giving the people that own the land the information that they could understand what that was worth. Eloise, can you give us an example of an individual landowner whose land and interests have been abused in this way, mismanaged in this way. Take James um, Mad Dog Kennerly, who is from the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, where I am from. And um, he is a landowner, and he, he owns three or four oil wells on his land. Um, and he, uh, his statements come in, and he ends up like owing the oil company and it's it's very difficult to even talk about it you know you can you can go in homes at Blackfeet that um, you know there's four or five families living in one home uh, yet they've got acres of land they've got oil wells they've got you know it's amazing you know this case has been talked about with so much excitement by people who see it as the the opportunity to right so many wrongs that have taken place over so much time. Why do you think it's such a strong case? I think this case is about change and changing the way the government has been accountable to Native people. And now we're talking about something that's tangible. This case is about people's money, and I think that this is something that they can't walk away from.
watching Free Speech TV, what democracy looks like. There is an active struggle going on in the remote woods of Canada. An aggressive logging corporation is ripping apart a forest, threatening the way of life for the Grassy Narrows First Nation. Their people are gathering international support to preserve the land. We said we gotta do something. We gotta protect this land because if we don't, there'll be nothing left for the, the children or the grandchildren or the great grandchildren. So that's how it all it all started. For thousands of years, the Grassy Narrows First Nation community has lived sustainably on this land in northern Ontario. But their land is being cut out from under them by forestry giants Weyerhaeuser and Abitibi Consolidated. And the more these behemoths clear-cut their forests and spray pesticides and herbicides on their land, the more their indigenous way of life is being fundamentally destroyed. David Sohn for the Rainforest Action Network has been involved in the community struggle for the past three years. Weyerhaeuser has a consistent pattern of moving into a, a pristine area, rapidly clear-cutting areas the size of downtown San Francisco at one go, uh, leaving nothing standing. Uh, and then once that's done, they clear the area, they plant it with a monoculture tree farm, uh, which they're plant to sp spray on a regular basis with pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, and then log it again in 60 years. So what we're seeing is the massive conversion of one of our last intact forest ecosystems into a monoculture tree plantation, uh, all to produce throwaway products uh, like, sh like shopping bags, and copy paper and, and the catalogs that we get in our mailboxes. Weyerhaeuser is the world's largest lumber company with logging rights to 35 million acres of land in Canada and their logging practices are consistently destructive. The Grassy Narrows community consists of about 750 members with limited resources and economic leverage. They are locked in a fight to not only save the forests but their very culture, which depends on hunting, trapping, and collecting medicines from the earth. They spray, they, they do like spray chemicals, and when it rains, that flows into the lakes, that affects, of course, the animals on the land that are land animals, and then also affects the water animals, and it affects us. That's all like Weyerhaeuser and Abitibi doing that. It's been a, a long process of cultural genocide because our people in the um, 1960s were still very close to the land and in 1972 when mercury was discovered on the, the water, our people that lived off fish traditionally were told not to eat the fish. Uh, they've suffered from mercury poisoning of their waters in their major food source of fish from the effluent of a pulp mill upstream. They've had their community relocated. Uh, they've suffered from flooding from a hydro damming upstream. Uh, and this is this clear-cut logging of their territory is, is, is kind of the last straw. The indigenous youth of the Grassy Narrows First Nations put their bodies on the line and lay down in the path of industrial logging machinery. They blocked access to their traditional lands and sparked what is now the longest standing indigenous logging blockade in Canadian history. It started with three young people that were tired of the forest being destroyed. It was the last option that we had because we tried all the other things like writing to the government, meeting with MNR, meeting with Abitibi, and just even writing to the Washington Post, New York Times, telling them not to use Abitibi paper. Last month, the Grassy Narrows First Nation sent a letter to the forestry giants to stop logging or face an international protest. The response has been overwhelming. Uh, uh, close to a dozen environmental and human rights uh, NGOs have already responded to Grassy Narrows' call and offered their support behind the community. And we are going to bring their struggle uh, to the markets where these products are sold, 
to the boardrooms where the decisions are made and to the legislatures where the laws are passed. And we're going to uh, make sure that this issue becomes the international scandal that it is. We say we are already rich people. Just leave us alone. Let, let us use our land how we want to use it. Let us feed our people how we want to feed them. And then our, our people become strong again and they'll not be dependent on, on the government anymore. Want to join the international campaign to help the Grassy Narrows First Nation? Visit www.freegrassy.org. There's an art of resistance. Source code wants your music, poetry, personal documentaries, and art. Like this next piece from Blackfire. So here we go. It's a long story. I'll try to make it short. We've been playing for 15 years. It's been a crazy, hectic year for us. Started off the tour in Africa, um, been throughout Europe a couple of times, Mexico, and also on the Warp Tour. So we're going to show you some highlights from uh, our journeys and also uh, talk about the issues that we try to address through our music. Hope you enjoy. Trek through thousands of miles of sand and camels, sharing our music and sharing our culture with the indigenous nomadic people of the Sahara Desert. Their culture is very similar to ours as Navajo people. The nomads of the desert, the Tamashek people, host these festivals all over the Sahara Desert. And the festivals are to talk about politics, talk about social, environmental issues that they are facing as a people. So they invite people from all over the Sahara Desert, from all over Africa, um, different places in the world to come and be a part of their festival to share what it is that other cultures can bring. Today, in this day and age, indigenous peoples and cultures are still resisting assimilation. We've survived genocide. From Native America to the deserts of Africa, all the way to Mexico and Europe, people are still carrying on their cultural ways of life and their cultural values. It is important for all of us to recognize that we are all indigenous people and we must share this earth and build healthy communities and we carry on in the spirit of resistance for our future generations.
have an opinion about the state of the world, have a local story, send us the tape, DVD, QuickTime file, webcam report, or cell phone video. Record your history. This is Participatory Media. Coming up next week, Source Code investigates war's effects on the environment. Whatever happened to the chemical weapons from World War I? Source Code found out they're stored under our nation's capital, and they're leaking right into the public water supply. We've got a government whistleblower to tell you all about it. Iraq's estuaries are the birthplace of the human race, and recent war has nearly destroyed them. Hear from a group trying to bring them back. And have you heard about depleted uranium? Millions of tons of radioactive material with a half-life of more than 4.5 billion years has been dropped on the Middle East. Anyone who's been there is at risk, and their wives and unborn children are too. That's all for this week. From everyone here at Source Code, I'm Stephanie Bernstein. And I'm Michael Jones. See you next time. Get out and get active. This is Participatory Media.